Hi, I'm Taryn Lupo from TarynLupo.com and I'm about to show you how to make your favorite wine for just three bucks a bottle. During this video, we're gonna be demonstrating a lot of equipment you've probably never seen or heard of. It's not a big deal. They actually sell a pretty inexpensive home kit that you can buy. I'll link to that over at TarynLupo.com. But right now, just kick back, enjoy the video, and then at the end of the video, I'll remind you and show you the link where to find this information. I'm not really a home brewer, so I don't know much about this world. I just found out that you could buy these kits that the wine companies make so you can make your own favorite wine at home for just pennies on the dollar. Hi, I'm Robert and today we're going to be learning how to make mead and wine. Um, the most important aspect to all of this is sanitation. So this is one product that we use called One Step. This you don't have to rinse off. We use that mostly at the end. Gloria and I used to have goats with high chlorine sanitizing powder for cleaning our milk products, so we prefer to use that with sanitizing all of our equipment. Whenever you're making beer or wine or mead, you must sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. However, with high chlorine, I have to rinse off my tools after they've been sanitized because I don't want any of that chlorine getting into my wine or mead. Get the hose clear. This calls for one tablespoon to one gallon. Same proportion. I'll show you what all these tools are for later on as we get to that particular step. Okay. We also sterilize our buckets. So this is where we will be making the wine in, and this is where we will be making the meat in. Gloria likes this step because uh, the floors tend to get very wet, and so it's a guaranteed mopping. The, the chlorine only needs a contact of about a minute. Doesn't take very long to uh, make sure that anything that might be living inside here is no longer living. And again, that's why we use the uh, high chlorine sanitizing. Because it will get rid of any little spots, as you can see, inside. because nothing will spoil your wine or beer or mead faster than unwanted yeasts and bacteria. So I start with just scrubbing out any containers that I'm using with a sponge. A little bit of soap doesn't hurt, but primarily just to scrub the surface and then the high chlorine sanitizing fluid takes care of the rest of the job. Is it hard to get this last year now? Because I know for a while they assumed you were going to make crack with it and it was really hard to get. <laughs> and it was, I'm, I'm not kidding, it was like impossible to find Erlenmeyer plants. Um, it's not so much about the crack, I think. Uh, talking to my brother who teaches at uh, Rutgers in New Jersey. It's more about uh, laboratories and schools. They deal with plastic now because glass is dangerous. It can break, kids get cut. And so they've gone away from the glass. So the glassware is not really being made anymore. That's why it's so difficult to find. But I did find this on eBay. And this is where I'm gonna make my yeast starter in later on. So the, the company I buy my products, uh, my supplies from, can I say their name? Sure. 
Midwest Brew Supply. They sell this size flask as well, as well as the stopper and the airlock, so you can do a yeast starter. This, most of this came from them. So I've, I've rinsed my, my tools and materials. This is going to be where I'm making the mead in, and I'm currently sanitizing the bucket where I'm going to be making the wine in. So we're going to put an airlock in here. Once it's been washed, you want to get it covered. You don't want things falling in here and you're going to have it uncovered a few times. So the, the, the less time in the air, the better. So this is just another brewing bucket. I tend to have a lot of them. I've been doing this for years and I have one, as you'll notice, without a spout in it. There's no holes in this bucket and I use this as a sanitizing bath. I reuse the, the chlorine solution a few times, but after a certain period you don't get that chlorine smell, you know it's not strong anymore, you dump it out and make a new one. But I can use this for a few weeks. Your best bet is to buy buckets from a brew supply whether it's your local brew supply or Midwest brew supply or, or whoever, you'll notice they're right on the front of this bucket. They're all food grade. You don't ever want to make a product you're going to ingest in something that contained nasty chemicals or uh, spackle or whatever. I said that the most important part to making beer, wine, mead is sanitation. The second most important part is keeping records. So here's my notebook and in my notebook I have all the recipes that I've made over the years because if you make something and it cups out exceptionally good and you want to make it again you'll never do that unless you wrote down what you did before. Today we're making a wine kit so all the huge wineries, Stag's Leap, all the ones in Sonoma Valley, Australia, all over the place, they make wine, but they always end up with more juice than they can do anything with. And so they found that it's also profitable to sell the juice in kits. So you can make their wine at home for far less than they charge in the stores. So this kit is um, Eclipse from Sonoma Valley. It's a Pinot Noir and inside the kit here they give us a nice little package with all the additions. Also an instruction booklet where we can keep our notes. Again, keeping notes is important. And the kit comes with a huge bag of their grape juice inside. So I'm going to prepare this now for pouring. So as I said earlier, uh, keeping instructions. The kit comes with a set of instructions and the first thing we want to do is peel off the sticker. It gives us the barcode, gives us all the information we need to know. We're going to stick that right here. We're also going to put the date and I believe today is the 11th. So I'm going to put that there. We're going to check through our ingredient packet here. Ah! Oh! This is really cool. They even sent labels for the bottles in the kit. My wife's gonna love that. We have potassium metabisulfite, potassium sorbate, bentonite, and these look to be toasted oak. Very nice. And of course, cheetah sand. So the ingredients we're going to be using in the beginning will be the toasted oak, if I'm not mistaken. Add your yeast. We're going to be using the bentonite, which I'll show you in just a moment. And of course our yeast, which is uh, probably going to say this wrong, wrong, Borgovin RC212. Yeast is very, very important to whatever you're making. It adds a flavor profile depending on the yeast. It can do a higher alcohol, it can do a lower alcohol. So your yeast is a very important ingredient when you're making your choice as to what to use to ferment your wine or beer or mead or whatever. The first step in the wine process is to add something called bentonite, which is a clay. It's a gray clay. The reason we add this 
is because it binds with microscopic solids that are floating in solution, helping to clarify your wine so it's crystal clear at the end. It makes a nice product. So in order to do that, we're gonna take one cup of boiling water, put it in the bucket, and then we're gonna add the bentonite and stir it up and make a big muddy mess. It helps to sprinkle the bentonite in rather than just dumping the packet. Otherwise it clumps up a lot, it makes it hard to dissolve it. And then we take our spoon. Now that we have our muddy water, we're going to add the juice. Now we're adding the juice, so I'm going, I've pulled the cap up through the box. The box creates a handy little holder right here. The cap isn't always easy to get off, but with a little practice it comes off well. And this creates a nice way to pour your, want, your juice into the bucket. We're going to be bottling uh, later on uh, Pinot Grigio Pineapple um, Pear. So yeah, they've got every flavor in the world that you would want. Here's the empty bag. You can see there's still juice in here. And as per the instructions, I'm going to take some of that hot water. I'm going to pour it in the bag. I'm going to cap it. Rinse it out real good. Beautiful juice sitting at the bottom. Take the cap off again. Get every drop of juice. So this is an extremely uh, strong bag. It's got a double wall. Uh, you can use this for storage of water. But since it's good for storing juice, say you have a batch of raspberries or blackberries that you want to make wine out of, you can juice them, stick them in this bag, Chuck them in your deep freeze and they're ready for when you want to make some wine. So the next step in the instructions here that I have is we've got the juice in, the bentonites in, now we need to raise the water level up to six gallons. And while some purists swear by uh, well water, filtered water, uh, whatever kind of water, I don't have access to that anymore. I used to have our own well water, no longer, so I just use the city water. I haven't found that it makes a difference to me or my wife, and so it's good enough for us. I filled the bucket to the six gallon mark. Uh, it says here six gallons is to the inside rim, inside there. You'll also notice I have a thermometer on the outside of your bucket because you don't want to pitch the yeast in at too high of a temperature, otherwise you'd kill your yeast and that would be counterproductive. So you want to have the temperature of this liquid below 80 degrees before you throw the yeast in. And the temperature in here currently is about 73, 74 degrees, which is actually perfect. So the instructions now say once we've stirred it vigorously for 30 seconds because we want to mix the water in with the juice to get it all in the right place. We're going to draw a sample of the juice 
and we're going to see what its specific gravity is with a tool called a hydrometer. This is a hydrometer which will tell us how much sugar is in solution which then will tell us how much potential alcohol we can expect when it's done fermenting. So we just need enough liquid till it's floating. Then we read the hydrometer, give it a spin to get any bubbles that might be attached to the side to mess up our reading. And it tells me that it is 1.09 We then record that, 1.092, and we check the wine kit. It says that it should be between 1.080 and 1.100, so we're exactly in the right spot. 1.092 will give us a potential alcohol of 12% alcohol. So the next step in the kit here, if your wine kit contains oak or elderflowers, tear open the packages, sprinkle them into the primary fermenter now. Uh, if it has more than one package, add them all. Stir them under the surface of the liquid. So here's the oak. So since you're a home brewer, you're not going to have oak barrels to age your wine in. So this is toasted oak into uh, like a powder, if you can see on top as I'm sprinkling it. And this is going to soak in the wine and it's going to give it an end flavor as if I had it in an oak barrel for a few months. Here's the toasted oak sawdust on top of the wine and now I'm going to follow the instructions and stir it in. So you may ask what happens to all these oak chips in my wine? Well they're going to suck up uh, liquid and they're going to settle their way to the bottom of this primary fermenter so that the next step when I transfer this to a glass carboy or a plastic carboy and a carboy for anyone who doesn't know are those uh, water jugs that you see in the offices at the uh, at the water container the water dispenser um, and at that point I'm going to transfer off basically just liquid uh, most of the solids will have settled to the bottom and I'll be throwing them wherever into the garden or down the drain, doesn't matter. So the oak chips are thoroughly mixed in, I'd say. Got a little bit of foam on top, but it's not bad. See if we can't get all the oak chips in there. Don't want to steal too many. There we go. And the last step here is make sure my temperature is between 72 and 75 and my temperature currently is 73, 74 so that's exactly where I want it. The last step for today is to add the yeast and so we simply rip open the package of yeast, sprinkle it onto the surface Some kits will tell you to stir the yeast in. This particular kit says, do not stir in. It will activate on its own. So at this point, we take our lid, we seal it in place. We make sure that our airlock contains water. I hope you can see that. Hopefully you can see the water, I'll make it go up and down a little bit. 
The airlock is to prevent oxygen from getting in and or contaminants from getting into your wine while it's doing its thing. Um, you've created a sterile environment, you've introduced yeast, one specific kind of yeast, and you don't want foreign yeast getting in here to turn it into vinegar or whatever. And so the airlock prevents anything from going backwards because it has water within the trap here and it will allow out carbon dioxide that are created by the yeast in the process of turning sugar into alcohol. The last and final step is to take this bucket with your wine and all your ingredients, with your, your juice and all your ingredients, and go put it into a darkish room. Room temperature, 70, 72 degrees is fine, a little bit below, that's fine too. Basic room temperature, and it's gonna sit for about a week. In about a week's time, we're going to test with the hydrometer again what the solution is at to see whether it's below 1.0. If it is at that time, we will transfer the liquid from here into a carboy, which is neither a car nor a boy, but it's still called a carboy. Here it will sit for another 10 days or so. We'll add other findings to drop any solids out of solution to make a very clean, clear product, and then we will bottle. So when using a bucket that doesn't have an awesome, easy spout, as you see down here, how to get the liquid from here into your carboy is through the use of a racking cane and a piece of hose from Home Depot. Properly sized to fit onto your racking cane. This goes into solution, you form a siphon to get the stuff flowing. This piece on the bottom prevents most of the stuff at the bottom from getting sucked into the tube and into your, your carboy. Simple as that. So it's a week later and we're at the next step in the winemaking process. Uh, what you can see here is what is known as foam over, where if you're making a wine or a mead that contains a lot of fruit, sometimes it'll create a lot of foam at the top while it's in the process of fermenting and the foam gets up into the lock and spews everywhere and makes a bit of a mess. But the next step is we're going to transfer into a sanitized carboy. We have our racking cane, a length of hose, and you'll notice the racking cane has a, a bit of a piece on the bottom. This helps us to not suck up too much sediment from the bottom, so we simply place this in. And that's it. Uh, the bottom of the bucket now contains a little bit of wine and a lot of sediment. Uh, in this kit it would be a bunch of the wood chips that we added earlier. And so we're going to simply stir it around to get it all mixed up and pour it down the drain. This is a very fancy airlock. It simply has a glass bead on the inside which sits down in the hole. It allows any new gases to escape while not letting oxygen into the bottle. We simply put this into the top. The unit's now corked. We take it into another room. We put it in a cool, room temperature 70 degrees dark i cover it with a shirt area and we let it sit for another two weeks this time because we did the transfer a little bit more ferment can take place and so this may allow more gas to come out plus the liquid is full of carbon dioxide right now so in two weeks time when we measure the specific gravity of the liquid we will also whip this mixture to release all the gas. We'll put our finings in to 
prevent it from, to, to cause it to uh, settle out. And then this will become perfectly clear a week after that and we'll be bottling. Beaujolais Nouveau is new wine. And that's a red wine that is typically drank young, but most red wines you want to wait a year. Uh, once you get it into your glass bottles, you put it on your shelf and really try hard not to drink it. Sure, it's going to taste good to you because you made it, but the longer you age a red wine, the better it gets, the more flavors come out. So you really want to wait a year. It's about a week since we transferred the wine from the bucket into the carboy. And now we're going to test it to see if it's at the proper level for finalizing. As always, all my tools are sanitized prior to doing this. I remove a sample from the carboy into my testing jar. And the specific gravity is right where we need to be, 0.998. As per the instructions, because the specific gravity is right, I'm going to open the packages of potassium metabisulfite and potassium sorbate. I'm going to dissolve them in a half cup of cool water. So once it's all dissolved, we're going to pour it into the wine in the carboy. These two items specifically, the potassium metabisulfite stops any further fermentation that might occur and the potassium sorbate prevents any new fermentation from occurring later on. Now for a very important step. This is a whipping cane. This is my drill. Inside here, due to the fermentation, there is carbon dioxide that's trapped in solution. This can prevent your wine from settling properly and clarifying. So I'm going to put the racking cane, which has been sanitized, into my drill. This step also has the distinct possibility of being quite messy. So do it on a floor that uh, isn't going to be a problem. The other effect of the whipping I just did was it helps to disperse those previous chemicals within the entire bottle, the entire container of wine. And lastly, we're adding something called cheetah sand, which is a clarifier. This will bind with any particulate matter that are still floating around and cause it to drop out to give you a very nice clear wine. This is a product made out of shellfish. So people who are allergic to shellfish might want to choose a different clarifier and simply pour it in. And then you whip it a little bit more to mix that into solution. The last step before we put this away in a cool, dark area to allow it to settle out is we fill up with water. The reason we have this space is because it had the potential to foam up. So we gave ourselves a little bit of room. Now we're going to top up with plain water till the wine comes up to the neck. and put our airlock back on 
to prevent any oxygen from getting into solution. Now we put it to bed for a couple of weeks and then we can bottle. So we're on to the process of bottling our wine. This is a bottle washer. This is an adapter for the bottle washer. So I simply take off the end of my faucet. I thread on the adapter. Make sure it's good and tight so you don't have water shooting everywhere. I attach the washer. Then I put my hand over the end and turn on the water. Because if I didn't do that, it would have sprayed across the room. Then I get a bottle. Place it on the washer. One bottle washed. It forces a high speed jet of water into the bottle, rinsing out and dislodging any things that may be in the bottle. If you notice that there's some stuff stuck in here that the that didn't get out, then you use a bottle brush to scrub that. But these are all clean, I know, because I did them recently. This is a bottle tree. Very inexpensive item that hangs the bottles in a way that allows the water to drain out of them. It's always good to put them all the way around because if you get too much weight on one side, it'll fall over. As for bottles for your bottling, just ask your friends. They will give you empty wine bottles. You soak them a little bit to get the labels off. Some companies use uh, less glue and it's easier to get them off, but either way, People will give you bottles for free, and this is the ultimate in recycling. Not that thing where you send it off to the town and they go and they end up selling it to somebody who just smashes them up and goes into the regular garbage. No, this is real recycling, where you use the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, because it's glass. So the cork trees exist for a long, long time, and they just periodically peel them for a new layer of cork. It's uh, quite amazing, they're kind of harvested. Yeah, it always amazes me, people get all up, up, uppity about this. We should do more recycling. You wanna do more recycling, do recycling at home. Don't throw your shit out, reuse it. For convenience, this thing spins around as you need it to. So this is one step. It requires one tablespoon per gallon, so since there's three teaspoons in a gallon, we're going to go with one teaspoon per quart. And we're going to add that to our bottle tray. So this uh, bottle tree has a handy dandy little feature on top. And I have sanitizing liquid in here. And now I go like this. And here it comes. It sprays sanitizer up into the bottle. And now this bottle is ready to be filled with wine. So I'm adding corks now to more of this one step. I have to sanitize the cork so that I can jam these into the top of the bottles, being sanitary, so I get a clean product. So that's 20, 22, 30, 22, 60, 60. And you'll say, well, those aren't in any sanitizing fluid. That's why I have another pot. And I'm going to force them down. Till liquid comes out the sides. Now I know they're underwater. They only need a few minutes in there, and once that's done, I can take them directly out of the fluid and cork them in the top of a bottle. 
So here we are ready to bottle. Uh, this is an apple sizer, uh, which is a type of mead made from apples. This has taken me about a year to make because, and I already bottled some of it, but because I forgot that fruit contains pectin and pectin doesn't allow the haze to drop out. So it was hazy for a long, long time till I realized, hey, if I add some pectic enzyme and the next day it was beautifully clear. The one behind here is a kit, uh, Island Mist. Uh, pineapple pear pinot grigio that my wife wants to try. We're going to be bottling both today and uh, this is how we do it. This is a bottling cane. This is a piece of hose from Home Depot. We simply connect to our bottle. The reason I'm doing it here in these crazy funny looking quarters is because the stuff is settled to the bottom here and I don't want to carry it to another room and stir that up because then it's cloudy again. So I'm leaving them right where they settled so that I have the cleanest, clearest product I can. Now I'm going to place the cane into a bottle and I'm going to open the valve. I'm now going to open the valve on my better bottle. You can see it begin to flow and begin to fill the bottle. The uh, bottling cane is especially helpful. There's a little valve on the very bottom that when I press it to the bottom of the bottle it allows the liquid to flow but as soon as I lift up it lets go and when you pull it out it leaves exactly the right amount of head space at the top of your bottle. They do sell very expensive units that will bottle six or more bottles at a time. Uh, I have never had the money to put aside for that so I go with a simple cane. These bottles are nice because I can just go like this. That one's done. That one's done. And the wife likes you much better when you have a towel for the spillage. Um, as you can see in the center of the bottom of that bottle there's a hump and you might be able to see the the spout that's there and the idea here is the hump allows you to get as much liquid out of the bottom as possible and now we're going to turn the spout down possibly sucking up a little bit of sediment but if you're going to drink it yourself you don't mind And this is an interesting point where we try to do this and not overflow our bottles. And at this point, if you don't really care, you can go like this. So the last bottle is a little cloudy. It's for you to drink. Okay, that's good enough. Now we take a cork. Stuff it into the corker. Place in the corker a bottle. Press down on the lever. We have a freshly corked bottle of wine. It's pretty cool, huh? Four little plastic things that squash the cork down, shove it into the bottle, and it expands as soon as it gets in. 
Now we're uh, bottling a pineapple pear, Pinot Grigio. Yep, Island Mist is the name of the kit. And one six gallon carboy is gonna give you almost three cases of wine. Two cases, two and a half cases. So here we have a bunch of bottles of my apple sizer. And I also have a very cool item that you can get from Brew Supplies. Uh, Midwest Brew Supply has these. They're shrink wrap neck caps. So I place one on each bottle. So these are heat shrink. And I originally started with a paint stripper gun, but you have to spin the bottle. And if you're too close and you're not careful, you'll melt the side, you, some side gets wrinkled, it doesn't look quite right. Then I tried putting them in boiling water. And boiling water does the trick instantaneously and it gives a beautiful product in the end. We have a bottle, shrink wrap cap, hold it with my index finger, into the water, out of the water, done. Order this just goes really fast. It just goes that fast. And it gives such a nice, professional, you know, capped. Here we are at the final step in the process of producing a nice bottle of wine and or mead. And so my wife is the art department, prints labels up on staple stock. And this way I know what's on my shelf and she can pick out whatever it is that she would like to drink. And it's just a matter of peeling the label. and sticking the label. Right. So many of these, uh, these are coastal white that I'm labeling right now, but uh, a great many of these <clears throat> are kits that are sold, the, the juice is sold from all these high-end wineries like Stag's Leap and such and you are essentially making the same wine that you would pay 60 or 70 dollars a bottle for in the store at home for again depending on the kit three four five dollars a bottle for something that in the store would cost you 60 70 dollars a bottle. I hope you're excited about home brewing and want to give it a try, all you have to do is go over to terranlupo.com and sign up. That'll take you to a page that gives you all the details of all the equipment you'll need. So go check that out. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet, now's your chance. Just click this button right here. Also, please remember to give this video a thumbs up, a like, a share. And if you have something to add, please comment below. One last thing is stop over at terranlupo.com to see all my private and unlisted videos. I currently have an unlisted video about how to make your own mead. So if you want to learn how to make honey wine, all you have to do is go over to terranlupo.com, sign up, and it'll take you right to it.